Glass Onion and its predecessor, Knives Out, are widely regarded as some of the best whodunits to have been released in recent memory. But what if I told you that these movies aren't actually mysteries at all? You see, despite taking inspiration from classic mystery franchises like Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie novels, the Knives Out series is so concerned with subverting the tropes of the genre that it has transformed into something else entirely. So today, let's take a look at how Ryan Johnson wrote the perfect anti-mystery, and then how he did it again. Before we can properly examine the two films in question, we need to first establish how Ryan Johnson approaches the craft of making movies. Johnson is first and foremost a deconstructionist filmmaker. His passion lies in dismantling a genre or franchise down to its most essential pieces, and then recontextualizing those elements in a way that both surprises and satisfies the audience. However, unlike the final season of Game of Thrones, the twist and turns in Johnson's work are always rooted in the themes and characters at the core of the narrative. This ensures that all the surprises are earned and that they further the story, rather than feeling like a betrayal of the audience's trust. He subverts genre conventions not for shock value, but rather to comment on the core subject of his film. With that in mind, you can start to see why he'd be so eager to jump into the world of murder mysteries. There is perhaps no other genre quite as trope-filled as the whodunit. The appeal of these stories comes largely from their formulaic structure, in which authors can essentially play narrative mad libs and have a compelling caper in no time at all. Much like Hallmark movies, even a mediocre mystery can act as a sort of cinematic comfort food, easing you in with familiar archetypes types like the eccentric detective, the murdered millionaire, or Angela Lansbury. Ryan Johnson, however, doesn't want to make cinematic comfort food. He wants to make a mac and cheese so fancy it'll put Kraft out of business. And in 2019, that's exactly what he did. See, the marketing for Knives Out heavily leaned into the tropes that it was subverting. They implicitly framed Daniel Craig's Benoit Blanc as the lead, and led audiences to believe that this would be a compelling, albeit traditional, detective story. But as soon as you sit down to watch the film itself, it quickly becomes clear that this is anything but traditional. The film begins with a cold open that reveals Harlan Thrombey, a wealthy patriarch and novelist, has seemingly ended his own life. Testimonies from his dysfunctional family reveal that they all have reasons to wish him ill, but all reinforce that his passing was self-inflicted. The inciting incident comes when Detective Benoit Blanc reveals that he believes foul play was involved. Suddenly, the case becomes a murder mystery, and he intends to find whoever did it. However, Benoit Blanc isn't actually the main character. In reality, our protagonist is Ana de Armas' character, Marta. She was Harlan's nurse, and was much closer with him than his actual family members. Right off the bat, it's clear she knows more than she's letting on, which sets us up for the first big twist of Knives Out. The transition between Act 1 and Act 2 is a flashback, which reveals that while administering medication for Harlan, Marta grabbed the wrong bottle and injected him with an apparently lethal dose of morphine. Unable to find the antidote, Harlan believes he only has minutes to live. Not wanting Marta or her undocumented family to come under scrutiny, he plans an alibi for her and takes a knife to his own throat. The reason this moment is such a big deal is because the central question of the narrative is no longer who done it, but rather Marta done it, will she get away with it? Mechanically speaking, the film transforms from a mystery into a thriller, and we spend the next two thirds of the story waiting to see if Marta can successfully cover up her tracks with Benoit Blanc hot on her trail. It's a huge bait and switch, but once again, it's intrinsically motivated by the characters and theme. Knives Out is a story about loyalty and entitlement. The Thromby family as a whole is a critique of the faux liberal one percenters that 
claim to be progressive, but take a not-in-my-backyard approach to politics. For instance, the whole family claims to love Marta and states that she's like a member of the family but she wasn't even invited to Harlan's funeral. Each member claims they were outvoted on the matter, but it's clear they just want to save face. There's even a running gag where each time someone brings up where Marta was born, they all list a different Spanish-speaking country. Immigrants, we get the job done. Additionally, each of the Thrombies believes themselves to be owed an inheritance, so the moment Marta is listed in Harlan's will, the entire family turns on her, and their implicit racism becomes far more upfront. The transition from mystery to thriller encapsulates the fact that Marta is all alone in her struggles. Even Chris Evans' character, who appears to be assisting her after the midpoint, turns out to just be covering up his own tracks. Speaking of which, one twist wouldn't be enough for Knives Out. Ryan Johnson cleverly subverts his own subversion by revealing that this story was a whodunit after all, with Ransom having switched the medicine in order to frame Marta. This double reversal is truly brilliant, as it allows the film to have its cake and eat it too. You see, most murder mysteries, while entertaining, suffer from an inconsistent pacing, as there's not a lot to be done in the time between each clue presenting it. Itself. But by structuring the story like a thriller, the moment-to-moment -moment tension never lets up, and our protagonist maintains a high degree of agency within the plot. Additionally, the return to the whodunit format in the final moments allows the film to be incredibly rewatchable, with the audience noticing how each and every piece fits together on second or third viewings. When Marta watches from the balcony as the thrombies are escorted off what is now her property, the audience audience feels satisfied, because their expectations were subverted, but they were still given a high quality story. By inverting the classic whodunit structure, Ryan Johnson deftly established his own subgenre of anti-mystery. But how does a director follow up such a revolutionary film? After all, audiences are now expecting big twists and unconventional structure. Well, the biggest magic trick Ryan Johnson pulls off in Netflix's Glass Onion is doing the exact same thing as last time, but different. In many ways, Glass Onion is a more conventional mystery than its predecessor. So much so, in fact, that the film is structured into two acts rather than three. Without getting too technical, two act structure focuses on setup and payoff, rather than beginning, middle, and end like most stories. Basically, the two act structure was far more common in classic murder mysteries, and lends itself to ensemble pictures that have a somewhat play like quality. The tension often comes more so from character dynamics than the overall plot. In Glass Onion, for instance, not a lot actually happens for the first half of the movie. Edward Norton's character, Miles Braun, has invited his group of friends to his private island for the weekend. It's established pretty quickly that the group has a tense relationship with Andy, and that Benoit Blanc was not actually invited by Miles, but otherwise, the main mystery doesn't present itself until the midpoint. See, after an hour of of establishing all the characters, their motivations, and the personal dynamics they have with one another. All hell breaks loose when Dave Bautista's character Duke is poisoned. And this is where Ryan Johnson starts to show his hand. Yeah, so it turns out the main murder in the movie actually took place before the film even began. See, Andy's a genius, Miles is a mooch. Andy came up with a business called Alpha on a napkin and went into business with Miles. Miles wanted to invest in a fuel called Clear, but Andy said no because it was highly unsafe. Miles has Andy cut out of the company and pressures their friends into lying for him. Then Andy finds the napkin and threatens everyone, but she dies mysteriously and the napkin disappears. Turns out, the Andy we saw isn't Andy, but is Andy's twin sister, Helen. <gasps> Yeah, like the parent trap. Anyways, Helen hires Blanc, who's dating Hugh Grant. That's not important, I just think it's cute. Finally, Blanc convinces Helen to pretend to be Andy, so that they can both go to the island and snoop. 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 Essentially, the investigation was playing out this whole time, without the audience even realizing it. And this all connects back to the central theme of the story, which is that Ryan Johnson hates Elon Musk. People are so mean, not lying. 
To put it another way, Glass Onion is Ryan Johnson's critique of uber-rich pseudo-intellectuals. Whether you think that Mr. Musk falls into this category is one thing, but Edward Norton's cartoonish billionaire is quite obviously meant to be a caricature of Elon. The film regularly hints at the fact that Miles Braun is not as smart as he seems. His monologues are littered with made-up words, and it's revealed over time that all his success came from latching on to other other people's talent. These clues keep popping up until Benoit Blanc finally concludes that Miles Braun is an idiot. Basically, everyone overlooks the possibility of Miles being guilty because he'd have to be stupid to commit such an obvious crime. People ascribe to him a high level of intellect because they assume that's what is required in order to be successful. But it turns out that with a little luck and billions of dollars, even an idiot can be put in a position of power. It is a simple yet clever trick that Ryan Johnson pulls on us. A red herring is a character designed to arouse suspicion in the audience, and draw their focus away from the real culprit. Therefore, fans of the mystery genre know that the first and most obvious suspect is almost never guilty, so they reflexively write off Miles as innocent. Essentially, Glass Onion is the ultimate anti-mystery, because the answer was right in front of us all along, but the audience chooses to believe that there's something more complicated happening. And this is Ryan Johnson's commentary on the 1%. Regular people desperately want to believe that there is some great mystery in how the uber wealthy acquired their power and influence, because the truth right in front of us, that much of the world's wealth is built by taking advantage of other people's hard work, is much more depressing. We would rather turn a blind eye and benefit from the system secondhand than risk our own comfort to confront this corruption. Now, in creating such a metatextual anti-mystery, the movie movie does risk alienating the audience at certain points. Until you understand what Ryan Johnson is trying to say with the film, it's easy to feel like the plot is moving by slowly and without direction. Personally, I didn't love Glass Onion the first time I saw it, but that's kind of the whole point. Sometimes, you have to look at something more than once in order to fully appreciate it. Now, is that a meaningful insight, or am I equally guilty of being a pseudo-intellectual? Either way, I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.